This year, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres hosted a climate change summit and young people challenged leaders to take action. State Representative David Michel from the U.S. state of Connecticut is working to protect his coastal community. I asked him if he believes leaders are starting to listen to the warnings of climate change. I know some leaders are listening. What's important is also developers, cities. I was uh, at the climate summit, particularly on the focus of cities and local governments. Uh, as it was mentioned during the summit many times, 70% uh, of the uh, uh, emissions uh, in terms of fossil fuel emissions are coming from the cities. Uh, so uh, this Climate Action Summit was very interesting. There was a lot of information shared. I think that's one of the main points, is that people are sharing information so that places that are maybe behind can catch up or find, uh, find ways to fight climate change without reinventing the wheel. So David, at a gathering like this, of course, climate change is getting a lot of attention. The world's media is here. But how do you keep the momentum going once these leaders go home? Well, Alan, I think it's pretty clear. Um, on many levels, uh, the children have to have support. And so adults like, for example, myself, legislators, have to continue bringing their message to the leaders. Uh, I'm in the uh, Connecticut State House. and. Uh, uh, we had a big, big rally, one of the biggest I've seen at the uh, Connecticut uh, state capitol. And uh, their message was as clear. The thing is, are the other legislators, are the leaders listening? You know, we've talked to uh, politicians here at the United Nations who tell us uh, some of them are mayors of cities and they've told us that they are taking the lead in combating climate change. In your instance, you want the state, the state of Connecticut uh, in the United States to take the lead. Uh, you talked earlier on about renewable sources of energy. Talk to us about that. What is Connecticut looking at? Well, uh, Connecticut is looking at, uh, at uh, well, uh, a 2,000 megawatt procurement uh, for the next decade or so. and. Uh, uh, this, is, this is something that has been missing here. There's some information that should be shared where it's perfect to bring in renewable energy. The thing is we have to do it properly. Uh, for example, with the offshore wind, uh, it's great to hear uh, the, the amazing response from one of the developers uh, to the uh, children's message, to Greta's message, and, and their response is, is good. But are they going to push themselves for strict environmental standards? And uh, I can explain when you, uh, for example, with offshore wind, uh, if you set up, if you, if you um, uh, install an offshore wind turbine, uh, you have several ways of doing it. Some ways could create noise pollution, enough noise pollution that could injure our North Atlantic right whales or other keystone species. And if you damage the marine ecosystem, then you weaken the oceans when the oceans are the climate regulators and they are the ones that uh, protect us from the impacts of climate change. So we have to make sure that uh, bringing renewable energy, we do it the proper way. Uh, the proper way, in, in, for instance, in, uh, in the North Atlantic, uh, in my view, would be to uh, bring in concrete gravity base, which is a silent technique uh, to set up the foundation of the wind turbine. It would not cause noise. Uh, therefore would be probably the most environmental way of doing this as well as creating more than 25 times the amount of jobs. So when we talk about a Green New Deal, when the children want us to uh, protect the environment but also create jobs and shape up the economy, this can be done. It's right in front of us. But once again, uh, developers have to also uh, uh, do the right choices. You know, you raise an interesting point there on the health of our oceans. Do you think there is enough of a focus uh, on keeping our oceans uh, clean? Because we hear often about the effects of climate change and the effects it has on land, on things like widely differing temperatures or storms, or as we've just seen here in the United States, hurricanes. But what about the oceans? Protecting the oceans will be protecting us. The oceans are climate regulators. They're not mentioned enough, uh, to my taste, uh, at such an amazing and needed summit. And uh, if we don't take care of the oceans and the wildlife, the marine ecosystems, the oceans that absorb uh, uh, the heat, the acidity, the oceans that are depleted in uh, wildlife, the oceans will stop protecting us. And so particularly for coastal states or islands, uh, countries that are, uh, that are on the water, you have to think carefully 
uh, about what we're doing with our oceans. For example, in the U.S., if you're looking at federal subsidies for the animal agriculture, for the beef industry, I would take all that money and I would simply give it to the fishermen and ask them if instead of fishing, they could pick out the pollution. And maybe there's a way of making money with pollution that's being pulled out of the oceans. Right, and you've been personally involved in this as well. I was reading about an effort that you started in Connecticut to get rid of uh, tens of thousands of pounds of trash, which was found on uh, parks, beaches, on streets, in wetlands. Uh, how did you embark on that effort? Well, I've, I've, I have a little bit of a background in activism uh, for humans and wildlife. Uh, and uh, I'd gone to document uh, uh, in Japan at the Cove, uh, the dolphin slaughters. And coming back here to the U.S., coming back home, uh, I thought I have to do something home, at home. And I started getting involved in uh, documenting the trash that was around our shores, uh, documenting uh, even fecal bacteria that's, uh, that's uh, being analyzed and found in our, in our waterfronts. Um, if we don't take action locally in our cities, uh, it's going to be hard uh, to fight climate change. Uh, so uh, I've been organizing cleanups, and people are so uh, involved. People get very involved. People get very motivated because they're actually physically doing something that counts. Um, additionally, at the state legislature, uh, I passed a, a bill in the House, not in the Senate, but in the House, in the State House of Connecticut, uh, banning shark fins uh, from being sold or traded so that the uh, international illegal fisheries uh, wouldn't bring their products in our state. Right. On the question of introducing climate change education in schools, I say there was a bit of controversy because there are some scientists, some of them prominent, who say, look, the, uh, the science on climate change is not yet settled, so it might be a little bit too early to introduce uh, climate change education into the school's curriculum because that could be, from education, it could become indoctrination. Uh, how do you respond to that? Well, Alan, the time is now. I think there's no questions about it. Uh, this is a, a matter of emergency. I fully support that statement. Um, we have climate deniers in the house and my, my best uh, advice to them uh, is to say, uh, if you want to care for your children and grandchildren, we're going to have to change things and we're going to have to pass comprehensive legislation to fight climate change. And we are a coastal state and uh, we are uh, uh, entering uh, deal deals with energy. So we need to have all of our attention on the real science, on the proven science, on the peer-reviewed science, uh, which is uh, available to everyone. I mean, it's, just, it's not just scientists who might sometimes say that the science of climate change is not settled. We have politicians here in the United States, for instance, President Trump, who are questioning uh, whether climate change is being caused by human activity. Uh, how big a challenge is that for people like you? Well, um, Anand, I think that going from the bottom up is one of the solutions that we're definitely contemplating. Uh, I have to say that uh, as a legislator, uh, I feel it's kind of shameless for other legislators or other people involved in politics to deny climate change and deny the science. Uh, I believe there's enough uh, uh, material. You have proof, you have living proofs of climate change. You have uh, climate refugees across the planet uh, already now. And uh, again, Anand, uh, I want to stress this, the time is now, so we don't have time to wait for President Trump uh, to change his mind on climate change. And uh, I think the people have to continue speaking up, the children particularly, and the legislators. We have to give our best support and bring it up in the House, the Senate, the State Houses, the State Senates, and the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. We need to push, 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 continuing the outreach, continuing the communication, the discussion. It's important. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu. Thanks for watching. Hello everybody, I'm Arnand Naidu. If you enjoy the thoughtful, engaged discussions you see on The Heat, you may also want to subscribe to our podcast. It's appropriately titled The Heat. Twice a week we take a deep dive on world headlines, talking to experts, journalists and others. It's a fresh, focused and intimate look at the issues that matter most. Whether it's the Hong Kong riots, the latest Middle East conflict or US politics, 
The Heat podcast gives the clear context needed to understand both what's going on and why. And what's best, we come to you. Whether you're at home or on the go, you can find The Heat podcast just about anywhere podcasts are found. Just search The Heat CGTN. Have a listen today and subscribe. Thanks.